Right, let's pick up from where we left off. Finally, Julie and George take the pictures to the ring where there's room to see them all. An hour passes as they try to assemble my puzzle. Ruby's awake now and she and Bob and I watch. Ivan, Ruby says, is that a picture of me? Yes, I say proudly. Where am I supposed to be? That's a zoo, Ruby. See the walls and the grass and the people looking at you? Ruby squints. Who are all those other elephants? You haven't met them, I say, yet. It's a very nice zoo, Ruby says with an approving nod. Bob nudges me with his cold nose. It is indeed. In the ring, Julia pumps her fist in the air. Yes, she cries. I told you, Dad. There is. There it is. H-O-M-E. Home. George gazes at the letters. He spins around to look at me. Maybe it's just a coincidence, Jules. You know, a once in a trillion kind of thing. Like that old saying about the chimp and the typewriter. Give him long enough and he'll write a novel. I make a grumbling noise, as if a chip could write a letter, let alone a book. Then how do you explain the rest of it, Julia demands, the picture of Ruby in the zoo. How do you know it's a zoo, George asks. See the circle on the gate? There's a red giraffe in it. George squints and tilts his head. Are you sure that's a giraffe? I was thinking more along the lines of deformed cat. It's the logo for the zoo, Dad. It's on all their signs. Explain that. George gives her a helpless smile. I can't. I can't begin to. I'm just saying there has to be a logical explanation. Look how big this is. Julia puts the last piece of Ruby's right ear into place. It's huge. It's definitely large, George agrees. Julia, Julia watches me. She chews on a thumbnail. I see the question in her eyes. She turns back to the paintings and stares at them, looking, truly looking. A slow smile dawns on Julia's face. Dad, she says, I have an idea, a big idea. Julie races round the edge of my painting, her arms spread wide. Billboard big. I'm not following you. I think this is meant to be on a billboard. That's what Ivan wants. George crosses his arm over his chest. What Ivan wants, he repeats slowly, and you know this because you two have been chatting. Because I'm an artist and he's an artist. Uh-huh, says George. Julia clasps her hands together. Come on, Dad, I'm begging you. George shakes his head. No, I'm not doing that. No billboard. No way. I'll get the ladder, Julia says. You get the glue. I know it's dark out, but the billboard's lit. Mark will fire me, Jules. Julia considers. But think of the publicity, Dad. Everyone would know about Ruby. You want me to put up a sign that shows Ruby in a zoo with the word home on it in giant letters. George gestures towards my pictures. A sign, incidentally, that just happens to have been made by a gorilla. Exactly. And you want me to, to do it without Max's permission, George asks. Exactly. No, George says. No way. Julia goes to the edge of the ring, careful not to step on any of my paintings. She picks up Max's claw stick. She walks back and hands it to her father. George runs a finger along the blade. She's just a baby, Dad. Don't you want to help her? But how would it help, Jules? Even if lots of people see Ivan's signs, it doesn't mean anything's going to change. I'm not exactly sure yet, Julia shakes her head. Maybe people will see the sign and they'll know that this isn't where Ruby belongs. Maybe they'll want to help too. George sighs. He looks at Ruby. She waves, waves her trunk. It's a matter of principle, Dad. P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L. L-E, George corrects. Dad, Julia says softly, what if Ruby ends up like Stella? George looks at me, at Ruby, at Julia. He drops the claw stick. The ladder, he says quietly, is in the storage locker. The next morning, I watch Mark's car slam to a halt in the parking lot. He leaps out, he stares at the billboard, his jaw is open. He doesn't move for a long time. Mad human. A mad gorilla is loud, but a mad human can be loud too, especially when he is throwing chairs and turning over tables and breaking the cotton candy machine. Phone call. Mac is kicking a trash can across the food court when the phone rings. He answers it, red faced and sweating. What the? he demands. He glares at me. I don't know what you're... he starts to say, but then he stops to listen. Who? Julia who? he asks. Oh, sure, George's kid. She's the one who called you. More talking. With the phone to his ear. Max comes closer to my cage, eyeing me suspiciously. Yeah, yeah, he says. He paints. Sure, we've been selling his art for quite a while now. There's another long pause. Yeah, absolutely. It was my idea. Mac nods. A smile starts at the corner of his mouth. Photos? No problem. You want to see him in action? Come on down. Have a look. We're open 365 days a year. Can't miss us. We're right off I-95. 
Matt picks up the overtuned, overturned trash can. Yeah, I think he'll be adding more pictures. It's, uh, you know, what do you call it? A work in progress. When the work call is done, Matt shakes his head. Impossible, he says. An hour later, a man with a camera comes to take my picture. He is from the local paper, the one Julia called. How about you take one of me with the elephant, Matt suggests. He drapes his arms around Ruby's back, grinning as the camera clicks. Perfect, the man says. Perfect, Mac agrees. Star again. A photo of my billboard is in the newspaper. Mac tapes the story onto my window. Each day, more curious people arrive. They park in front of the billboard, they point and shake their heads to take photos. Then they come into the mall and buy my paintings. While visitors watch, I dip my hands in fresh buckets of paint. I make pictures for the gift shop and pictures to add to the billboard. Trees with birds, a newborn elephant with glittering black eyes, a squirrel, a bluebird, a worm. I even paint Bob so he can be on the billboard too. I can tell he likes the picture, although he says I didn't quite capture his distinguished nose. Every afternoon, Mac and George add my new pictures to the billboard. People slow their cars while they work. Drivers honk and wave. My gift shop pictures now cost $65 with frame. The Ape Artist. I have new names. People call me the Ape Artist, the Prime of Picasso. I have visitors from morning till night and so does Ruby. But nothing's changed for her. Every day at 2, 4 and 7, Ruby plods through the sawdust with Snickers on her back. Every night she has bad dreams. Bob, I say, after I've soothed Ruby to sleep with the story. My idea isn't working. Bob opens one eye. Be patient. I'm tired of being patient, I say. Interview. This evening, a man and woman come to interview Mac and also George and Julia. The man has a large and heavy camera perched on his shoulder. He films me as I make my pictures. He films Ruby in a cage with her foot walked to the bolt in the door, uh, on, in the floor. Mind if I take a look around, he asks. Mac waves a hand. Be my guest. While Mac and the woman talk, the cameraman walks to the mall. He pans his camera right and left, up and down. When his eyes fall on the close stick, he stops. He trains his camera on the gleaming blade. Then he moves on. The early news. Mac turns on the TV. We are on the early news at five o'clock. Bob says, don't let it go to my head. There we all are. Mac, Ruby and me, George and Julia, the billboard, the mall, the ring and the close stick. Signs on sticks. In the morning, several people gather in the parking lot. They're carrying signs on sticks. The signs have words and pictures on them. One has a drawing of a gorilla cradling a baby elephant. I wish I could read. Protesters. More people with signs come today. They want Ruby to be free. Some of them even want Mac to shut down the mall. Free for Ruby. Ivan and Ruby. Elephants are people too. Animals need love. We love animals. Ruby! Ruby! In the evening, George and Mac talk about them. Mac says they're protesting the wrong guy. He says they're going to ruin everything. He says thanks for nothing, George. Mac stomps off. George, holding his mop, watches him leave. He rubs his eyes. He looks worried. Dad, Julia says, looking up from her homework, you know what my favourite sign was? Hmm, George asks, which one? The one that said elephants are people too. George gives her a tired smile. He goes back to work. His mop moves across the empty food court like a giant brush, painting a picture no one will ever see. Check marks. A tall man with a clipboard and pencil comes to visit. He says he is here to inspect the property. He doesn't say much more, but he makes many check marks on his paper. He looks at my phone. Check. He examines Ruby's hair. Check. He eyes our water balls. Check. Mac watches him scowling. Bob is outside, hiding near the dumpster. He does not want to be a check mark. Free Ruby. Every day there are more protesters and cameras with bright lights. Sometimes the people carrying signs shout, Free Ruby! Free Ruby! Ivan Ruby asks, Why are those people yelling my name? Are they mad at me? They're mad, I say, but not at you. A week later, the inspecting man comes back with a friend. A woman with smart, dark eyes like my mother's. She has a white coat on and she smells like lobelia blossoms. Her hair is thick and brown. The colour of a rotten branch teeming with luscious ants. She watches me for a long time. Then she watches Ruby. She talks to the man. They both talk to Mac. The man gives Mac a sheet of paper. Mac covers his face. He goes to his office and slams the door. New box. Something strange is happening. The white-coated woman is back with other humans. They place a large box in the centre of the ring. 
It's ruby sized. And suddenly, I know why the woman is here. She's here to take Ruby away. Training. The woman leads Ruby to the box. She places an apple inside. Good girl, Ruby, she says kindly. Don't be afraid. Ruby inspects the box with a trunk. The woman makes a clicking sound with a little piece of metal she is holding in her hand. She gives Ruby a piece of carrot. Each time Ruby touches the box, she gets a click and a treat. Why is she making that clicking noise? asks Bob. They do that to dogs all the time. Bob says, I can tell he doesn't approve. It's called clicker training. They want Ruby to associate the noise with the treat. When she does something they want, they make that noise. Great job, Ruby, the woman says. You're a quick study. After many clicks on carrots, she takes Ruby back to her cage. Why is that lady giving me carrots when I touch the box? Ruby asks. I think she wants you to go inside, I explain. But there's nothing inside, Ruby says, except an apple. Inside that box, I say, is the way out. Ruby tilts her head. I don't get it. See the picture of the red giraffe on the box? I think the lady is from the zoo, Ruby. I think she's trying, getting ready to take you there. I wait for Ruby to trumpet with joy, but instead she just stares at the box in silence. I'm not sure you understand. That box might be taking you to a place where there are other elephants, I say. A place with more room and humans who care about you. But even as I say these words, I remember with a shudder the last box I was in. I don't want to zoo, Ruby says. I want you and Bob and Julia. This is my home. No, Ruby, I say. This is your prison. Poking and prodding. The lady comes again. She brings an animal doctor with an awful smell and a dangerous looking bag. He spends an hour with Ruby poking and prodding. He looks at her eyes, her feet, her trunk. When he's done with Ruby, he enters my cage. I wish I could hide and not tug like Bob. Instead, I do a nice loud chest beat and after a moment, the doctor retreats. We're going to need to put this one under, he says. Not quite sure what he means. I stretch around my cage feeling victorious anyway. No painting. No one asks me to paint today. No one asks Ruby to perform. There are no shows, no visitors, unless you count the protesters. Max stays in his office all day. More boxes. I wake up from a long morning nap. Bob is on my belly, but he isn't asleep. He's watching the ring where four men are placing a large metal box. It's me-sized. What's that? I ask, still blurry from sleep. Bob nuzzles my chin. I believe that box is for you, my friend. I'm not sure what he means. Me? They bought in a bunch of boxes while you were sleeping. Looks to me like they're taking the whole lot of you, he says, casually licking a paw. Even Thelma. Taking, I repeat. Taking us where? Well, some to the zoo, probably. Others to an animal shelter where humans will try and find them home. Bob shakes himself. So I guess all good things must come to an end, huh? His voice is bright, but his eyes are far away and sad. I'm going to miss your stomach, big guy. Bob shuts his eyes. He makes an odd throat in his, he makes an odd noise in his throat. But what about you? I ask. I can't tell if Bob's just pretending to sleep, but he doesn't answer. I gaze at the huge shadowy box and suddenly I understand how Ruby feels. I don't want to go into that box. The last time I was in a box, my sister died. Goodbye. When George and Julia come that night, George doesn't get his mop or his broom. He gathers up his tools and belongings while Julia runs to my cage. This is my last night, Ivan, she says, and she presses her palm into my glass. Mac fired my dad. Tears slip down her cheeks. But the zoo lady said maybe they'll have an opening there in a while, cleaning cages and stuff. I walk to the glass that separates us. I put my hand where Julia's is, palm to palm, finger to finger. My hand is bigger, but they're not so very different. I'm going to miss you, Julia says, and Ruby and Bob, but this is a good thing, really it is. You deserve a different life. I stare into her dark eyes and wish I had and wish I had words for her. Sniffling, she goes to Ruby's cage. Have a good life, Ruby, she says. Ruby makes a little rumbling sound. She puts her trunk between the bars and touches Julia's shoulder. Where is Bob anyway? Julia asks. She looks around under tables in my cage by the trash can. Dad, she calls. Have you seen Bob? Bob? Nope, George says. Julia's bar wrinkles. What's going to happen to him, Dad? What if Max shuts down the whole mall? He says he's going to try and keep it open without the animals, George says. He stuffs his hand in his pockets. I'm worried about Bob too, but he's a survivor. You know what, Dad? Julia gets a gleam, gleam in her eye. Bob could live with us. Mum loves dogs and he could keep her company and Jules, I'm not even sure I have a job yet. I might not even be able to feed you, let alone some mutt. My dog walking money. Sorry, Jules. Julia nods. I understand. She starts to leave then runs back to my cage. 
I almost forgot this is for you, Ivan. She slips a piece of paper into my cage. 